What's the word, y'all? About a week or two ago, I saw this conversation slash discussion slash argument on Twitter revolving around the Cleveland Cavaliers. And in that moment, I wanted to get a tweet off, you know what I'm saying? I wanted to make a video, but I decided, no, I know I'm doing this series and eventually I'll be able to talk about the Cavs. Well, today is that day. And I don't have the tweets because I don't want to accidentally send hate to somebody for an NBA opinion that I disagree with. At the end of the day, it's basketball. Somebody's going to be right. Somebody's going to be wrong. None of it matters in the grand scheme of things. But the basis of this argument was a majority of the teams around the Cavs got better this offseason. So, A, with them not doing anything major, they set themselves up to not be ultra competitive this year, and they set themselves up to not be competitive during this regime of uh, Donovan Mitchell slash blank, blank, blank. And I, again, it's a sound argument, I would say, but I disagree with it on both fronts. So the idea is that like the Boston Celtics didn't need to get better. They beat the Eastern Conference by 14 games. They're just going to come back. They're probably going to dominate the East again. But the Knicks added Mikael Bridges. The Milwaukee Bucks added three minimum players that should make their players seven through nine significantly better and more impactful for the season. The Orlando Magic got KCP. The 76ers brought in goddamn Paul George. What did the Cavs do this season, this offseason at least? Uh, they brought back Evan Mobley on a max extension. They brought back Isaac Okoro, which is the last Wolds bomb we'll ever get, which feels weird to say aloud. Uh, they even brought back, what, Tristan Thompson? Like, they went heavily, and I mean heavily, on continuity. Um, and they, they got Jalen Tyson in the draft, which is I, I think is an intriguing pickup. But that's it. Especially when we talk about player movement, that is it. But I think that the best thing they could have done this offseason was changing the coach. I don't want to act like Kenny Atkinson was one of the 10 best coaches in basketball when he coached the Brooklyn Nets, but, but he did things that... I think are going to be beneficial for the Cavs. I think there are seven new head coaches in basketball, new slash players changing roles like J.B. Bickerstaff is now in Detroit. He's not a new coach, but he's in a new role. Um, and, and every time you see somebody change teams or get a new coaching job, one of the first things they say is that I'm going to come in and I'm going to change the culture. I'm going to steal some new culture. And it sounds good to the years. Oh my God, my favorite team got a new coach. And he said, the coach is going to shift. What our culture was awful. It's easy. To say you're going to change the culture, it's harder to do that. And I believe that Kenny Atkinson, based on his last spot, is a guy that can do that. Think about where the Brooklyn Nets were before Kenny Atkinson became the head coach over there. And think about what he was when they fired him because he didn't want to play De um, DeAndre Jordan. Like that 2018-19 Brooklyn Nets team was one of the darlings of all of basketball. They didn't have an extreme amount of talent, but damn it, they made the playoffs. D'Angelo Russell was an all-star. All and again, I'm not acting like Kenny Atkinson is this superior mastermind when it comes to basketball. I think there are things that he does very well and things that he doesn't do very well. And who knows, maybe he does turn into that after a few seasons being with the Golden State Warriors and so on and so forth. But one thing I remember quite vividly about his tenure with the Brooklyn Nets is that he maximized the talent that he had. There's this video by an account named Buckets Basketball where he put together a lot of the different sets that they ran during his tenure with Kenny Atkinson. And it's not like Kenny Atkinson reinvented the wheel, right? A lot of the stuff is things we've seen before on other NBA teams. But I want to be nice here when I say this. The stuff that's being ran here, let's just say it's more interesting slash thought-provoking, is that the right word, than what J.B. Bickerstaff was running over the last two seasons? Again, being nice, I, I do think that J.B. is an okay coach, but I think Kenny Atkinson is a better offensive-minded coach. I hate that we get an ad right in the middle of my article, whatever, though. Atkinson has plans to add Octane to Mobley scoring. It's not simply adding more three-point shot attempts. Yes, that's part of it. The goal is to increase Mobley's shots, period. Atkinson wants Mobley to, as a key part of the Cavs' fast break and other up-tempo offenses. Up-tempo offenses, you say? Well, they ranked 24th in pace last season. Up-tempo offenses, huh? I kind of like that. And when Kenny Atkinson was a coach of Brooklyn, his teams were first in pace, sixth in pace, and 11th in pace. Significantly different than what the Cavs just ran this year, but deeper than that. A lot of my optimism about this season slash the future of the Cleveland Cavaliers have to do with Evan Mobley. I know some people are off the Evan Mobley train because he hasn't got much better offensively since he came into the league. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a prisoner of the moment and small sample sizes. What I saw in the postseason last year made me extremely optimistic about what Evan Mobley can be as an offensive player. We know he is defensively, right? He's one of the best defensive players in basketball. I love him as a roamer in the Giannis slash Jaron Jackson Jr. role. I love that so very much. I even love it when he is the only sin on the roster on the court, even though those lineups aren't as successful as when it's both of them. I love to see him play both of these roles. That defensive part, done. It's going to be better and better throughout the course of his career. The offense is the place that if he is unlocked offensively, the ceiling of this team 
is, is ridiculous. And yes, the teams around them did get better, but they were they had so many hiccups and bad things happen to them last season. For them to still walk out as a 48-win team is incredible. P part of the biggest offseason moves is say, hey, we're coming into camp healthy. Because last year, we've used this before when we were talking about the, the Miami Heat. Last year, the Cleveland Cavaliers were fourth in basketball when it comes to minutes missed by top-end talent. I think Donovan Mitchell played 55 games. It was 50 games from Evan Mobley, 57 games from Darius Garland. Those dudes missed a ton of time, and they still walked out of there and won 48 games. So with some better injury luck, this is easily, in my mind, a 50-win team. I don't think it's a team that's going to go out there and win the Eastern Conference to compete with the Boston Celtics, but even with the other teams around them getting better, I trust that this team will maintain slash get better when it comes to their overall record. So they had everybody injured for a significant amount of time, except for Jared Allen, Max Drew. They also have like the same question overlapping on their team twice. And that has to do with, can their backcourt coexist together and be ultra successful? And can their front court coexist together and be ultra successful? And one of the main criticism was like, hey, you had to make a decision about that backcourt. You had to make a decision about the front court. At least do something. And my argument against that is like, I don't personally believe that every single team should be boom or bust. This is not a season where they need to really be in championship contention. Especially if, again, sometimes these players sign these match extensions and ask out a year later. But if you, you've convinced Donovan Mitchell to play the slow game or be chill with him being in Cleveland, that there's really no rush. Like, okay, yeah, things didn't work perfectly with these this backcourt slash this frontcourt together under J.B. Bickerstaff. We just upgraded our coach. I feel like it would have been would have been doing too much at one time if they changed the coach and made some major adjustments to their lineup. Because remember, Darius Garland is 24 years old. Jared Lowe is 25. Evan Moldy is 22. Donovan Mitchell is 27. This is a young team, y'all. And while it's not apples to apples, I always think about the fact because it's definitely not apples to apples, because both of these dudes are basically superstars now, that earlier in the career of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, people wanted to see one of them get traded. Overlapping skill sets was preached after every time they didn't make it to the finals and every time they lost. And what happened? These players evolved where their overlapping skill sets wasn't that big of a deal because they evolved as players where it's not that overlapping anymore. And guess what? They won a goddamn championship. So yes, last year of Donovan Mitchell and, and Darius Garland wasn't perfect. And it may never be perfect. But having a year and a half sample size, for me personally, is just not enough to say that they can't coexist or that Evan Mobley and Jared Allen can't coexist. So let's change the coach. A coach with a better offensive vision for what these guys can be. And if it still doesn't work, guess what? Darius Garland still has trade value. Guess what? Jared Allen will still have trade value. There is no reason to just pounce at the first thing because we feel like we should. This team is so young, bro. It's, they're so young. And um, we're just, I don't know, we, we live in an immediate results type of landscape now, not just in sports, but just in everyday life, where you want to see things be successful immediately. And a lot of times it's not necessarily the case. It will not hurt them to go 40 games to this next season with Kenny Atkinson to see if this core can coexist. And if it doesn't, maybe February is the time that they make a change. Hell, maybe they go the entire season, they wait to the next offseason. It's not like anybody is on an expiring deal. It's not like these guys are going to lose value because even with Darius Garland coming off one of his worst seasons, I guarantee you teams are out there will be calling and giving up good things for him because he was just an all-star two years back. And there's nothing about his game now that makes me feel like he can't get back to that. And I do see the stats, right? I do see the stats of Donovan Mitchell being significantly more impactful as a player when it's just him on the court. I do see the exact same thing for Darius Garland. I'm not blind to that. But I do, again, just want to see more of a sample size of Kenny is no excuse that that big run happened when it was only one of them on the court at a time. I can't, I can't, I can't negate that as fact. But also, I think I'm just traditionally just a little bit more patient when it comes to these things. The big question about this team shouldn't necessarily be about these guys, uh, these two pairings, can they coexist for this season? It's more about what that three position could look like, because I think we can all agree that the Cleveland Cavaliers will be a playoff team again. We can agree on that. Cool. Um, last year in the playoffs, that three spot really showed his ugly head, where when Max Struess was on the court, yeah, they defended him relatively well, but Max Struess 
has more seasons of him being an average shooter than him being an elite level shooter. And I think that the league is kind of waking up on that. Like he had the crazy run with Miami, but last year he was a 35% shooter from three on seven attempts. Again, these are good numbers. They're not the elite level sniper that I feel like you kind of need from that three spot if you're the Cavaliers. The year before that, he shot 50%. He only has one year in his career where he shot above league average from three. And that was 21-22 with the Miami Heat. And even in the postseason, the only time where he was an elite level shooter was the one series against Milwaukee in the first round in 2023, where he shot 41%. And then last year, he had two games where he hit some threes. It's kind of, it's kind of it. And Isaac Okoro, whether he's hit his shots or not, doesn't matter. He's not going to be guarded. And I like Ice. I think he's got better throughout the course of his career. But when you watch the minutes where it was him on the court in that first series against Orlando, they literally didn't guard the man. And for good reason. He shot like 20-something percent from three. And I think that Karis LeVert, while he does add another dynamic to the team by being another ball handle slash creator off the bench, when he's in those lineups with Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell, that's when it feels like it's way too... It's like stimulation overload for me. All of those dudes play have the similar like play style. I wonder what the numbers say. Let's let's go check out. So, you know, so I'll be looking using my eye test and I use the numbers to confirm some stuff that I see. Let me see what the eye test or the numbers say. Hmm... The numbers say that they get the job done. Small sample size, 150 minutes in the entire of last season. But that is very, very interesting. Almost a 10 net rating in those 150 minutes. Also very interesting. Again, Donovan Mitchell by himself is disgusting. Like he's a disgusting player. I just, I don't know what else to tell you. These numbers are ridiculous. I just don't know. Again, we know Donovan Mitchell. He's great. Like there's nothing I can say other than that. The man is phenomenal. They had a 8.7 net rating when it was just him and no Darius Garland. And when they were together, it was a four, which again, is still really solid. It's really good. Actually, I actually haven't looked at these numbers at all. I want to do the same thing for Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Wow. Why did I think this would be a lot higher? Jared Allen, Evan Mobley in 768 minutes, net rating of a one point, let's say five, we'll round up for it. When it's Jared Allen by himself, it's seven. And when it's Evan Mobley by himself, it's three. When it's both of them being off, Sheesh. <laughs> That's crazy. I can agree with the fact that you did want, you probably do want to see them do something more. Try to add, even if it is a new seventh man, eighth man. I completely understand that argument. But the idea that the Cavs won't have another successful season or somehow will be worse, I just can't get there, even with the teams around them getting better. I trust Kenny Atkinson to have this offense humming just a little bit more. I trust a leap in Evan Mobley. Maybe that is just where it all stems from. Evan Mobley better, team good. Evan Mobley the same, team good. No, 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 let's do that again. Evan Mobley better, team great. Evan Mobley the same, team good. And I think the now and the future of this franchise is really, really dependent on if Evan Mobley can take that all-star level jump. That's all I got though. Let me know what you think.